Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 12th. Wow, April 12th already. 2018. This is the week in charts. Dramatic pause. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. I am humbled by your presence. All right, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. And only thing I ask you to do there is wait until we get to the actual charts. And then when we do get to the charts, to the live charts, I should say, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as you want, but just ask about one ticker and then hit enter. And that way I'll get to all your stock picks. And that's for your benefit. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, I think today it's time to get back to the charts. I know, what a concept. And I want to talk a lot about what's happening with current conditions with a focus mostly on the potential bear market that we could be entering into. Could be in a keyword in that sentence. So rather than me telling you what I'm going to tell you, let's just hop right into it. There went to the disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I got that from my buddy, Greg Morris, who I borrow a lot from, and you'll hear a little bit more, more from him towards the end of the presentation. Uh, I left these random thoughts in, and they've been in here for quite a while. And I'm in a top fear mongering. That actually goes back quite a ways. And I, I think the reason I put that in there was that you have to be, you can't put your head in the sand. You have to pay attention to what's going on, but don't make any big picture predictions on that. And as I've said quite often, or ad nauseum even, let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. Right now we have a couple shorts on and we got taken out of all of our existing longs. So eventually we will have a bear market. And that's what I'm saying, winter is coming and in prior presentations when i pointed out some of these things i said but not just yet and then in more recent times we've added the question mark in now last week when we were talking about daylight as we have been talking about quite a bit and transitional patterns such as bow ties or first thrust the point is that every bear market will have one of these patterns and i'm going to walk you through where we are in the cycle in a few minutes but i know some of you have seen this chart a thousand times and you'll probably see it a thousand more it's just a cool thing to me that you have these major sell signals and major buy signals quite often at the beginning and the end of bull market cycles and bear market cycles however you want to look at it and these are just simple bow tie sells and bow tie buys. And by major, I mean coming off of, for sales, all-time highs in this particular case. Obviously, in the market, you're not going to get all-time lows. God forbid if we do, we'll have bigger troubles. But you can see this is an all-time high here. This is an all-time high here. And this is like a 10-year low or something. So that's pretty major. And then this, if memory serves, I think is a 13-year low. Well, you can just look. It goes all the way back to, what, 2003. And then you had that major buy shortly thereafter, obviously. And then we had a major sell back in 2015, 2016. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. And then we had a minor buy. Now, there's a few minor buys and sells in between, but... A minor buy is defined uh, uh, as, <laughs> let me rewind that, a minor buy or minor sell is defined as anything that occurs between major highs and major lows. So this is only like a one-year high here or so, and this is only like a six-month low, if that much, okay? So you have like a minor buy here and a minor sell here, if memory serves, or maybe it's more over here. Anyway, you did have a couple of signals that I didn't show in between, but it's your major buys and your major sells that you want to focus mostly on, okay? But we did have a minor buy coming out or coming after this major sell in here. 
And by the way, as I often preach, a major sell remains in effect, and I'll draw this on a few charts in a minute, but a major sell remains in effect until those old highs are taken out. It's not, does it mean that you want to hold the market if you're short until it makes new highs? Although in some cases you can, if you're trading something like an hourly bow tie off the S&P spiders or something like, let's say, Forex or whatever, and you, you're trying to catch a major turn in the market on an hourly chart, well, you might, you just might have that stop at that major high or major low, whatever the case may be. And then if you are blessed with the initial profit target, then at that point in time, you might look to take partial profits and then bump that stop closer to the market, the trailing stop. So we did have a minor sell, and it didn't really come unglued here after this major sell. But as Greg Morris, and there's, I tell you, I mentioned Greg again. As Greg Morris says, you have to treat all signals or take all signals seriously. And there's a few more little adages I've got from Greg. But take all signals seriously. Take all signals as if they will become the big one, Elizabeth implied. And you might get whipsawed, but as Greg also says when he was visiting here a couple years ago, he said that whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. Now, let's take a look at what happened in the Russell 2000 after that major sell signal. Now, I left this in here from last week. And I think this came off of, uh, this comes from Trading Full Circle. By the way, both of those charts were weeklies. When you get a weekly bow tie, a weekly major signal, it pays to pay attention. So in the Russell, we had a major signal back in 2015. And if you remember, or if you were following along with me back then in a trading service, I'll have to make sure I got the archives up. On my websites. I, th I think daylander.com slash archives. I have most of the archives up, but there are some holes that I've never patched. I need to patch those. Anyway, before I digress too far, we had all time highs in the Russell 2000, and then we had a bow tie. Now, we did get stopped out of our longs back then, and we did trigger in quite a few shorts, and we made a little bit of money on them. I think we might have made money on almost all of them. And then we got stopped out at a scratch for the most part. We didn't capture the mother of all trends because the market, as you now know, turned around and went right back on to make new highs. But what's interesting in this, Russell, after a bit of a slow start, remember this is a weekly chart, so this is many weeks in here. But notice that it never did take out that all-time high. So this signal remains in effect. Doesn't mean that you can necessarily short down here and hang on and all the way to up here without getting stopped out. It just means that for sake of whether it's a top or not, that top remains in place based on this signal until that high is taken out. Now, what's interesting is the market from that signal, from a textbook entry on that signal, did drop. And this, again, is a Russell, okay? It did drop 18%. And as I preach, the media calls a bear market or defines a bear market as a 20% drop. So for all intents and purposes, it was a bear market in the Russell 2000, close enough for government work. And you can see that it did end up hitting, what's this, about three-year lows in here, thereabouts. So it was a pretty serious signal, even though it was somewhat overlooked. Now, what I would encourage you to do in these indices are any market, any market, that you're looking to catch a top or bottom in, not catch a top, but see if it's topping or bottom, I should say. Got to be careful with that catching a top or catching a bottom. It sounds too close to picking a top or picking a bottom. Anyway, notice that the S&P 500, and again, this is a weekly chart. Notice that the 10 period simple moving average has turned down with vigor. Notice that the 20 period exponential moving average has turned down. Now, this is something I talked about in Trading Full Circle when I was discussing moving averages, and this is something I learned from Greg Morris. When a market crosses below, let's look back here to the left in 2017, for instance. When a market crosses below 
an exponential moving average, that exponential moving average will turn down immediately, okay? It's just mathematics. When it crosses above, that exponential moving average will cross back above. Notice that the simple day moving average, as I have talked about quite a bit in trading full circle, but notice that the simple moving average might take a little while to catch up, even though this is only a 10 period simple moving average. Now, I like the simple because it gives me a true representation of price, and it's a pretty cool little, uh, it can be a, a pretty cool little indicator in and of itself. By the way, I don't, I know there's a, you guys here know this, but I, I usually don't use too many indicators, although I'm going to show you some indicators here in a few minutes. But I'm going to frame it with a caveat of they don't indicate, indicate anything. They just show you what's already in the chart. So these moving averages turning down is just illustrating the fact, they're more illustrators than indicators. It's illustrating the fact that the market could be rolling over in here. Now, could's a key word in that sentence. But again, notice that. Whenever the market crosses below that moving average, like right here, the moving average will turn down. Now, it's kind of hard to see in this 30 period moving average, but it just kind of looks like this, just kind of like a gradual, oops, just kind of like a gradual little turn down if you were to magnify that. And then it was a gradual little turn back up. So it looks pretty flat, but it's something like this, gradually rolling over, gradually turning back up when that close goes right back above that moving average after being below it. So let's keep an eye on this to see if over the next few weeks this turns into a, a major bow tie sell signal. Now, last few weeks I said you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. Doesn't mean that's going to get you in as early as possible, but you certainly can't have a bear market without downside daylight or Dave Light, as we now call it. And Dave Light is simply the highs of the price bars are less than the moving average, or the lows of the price bars are what? Greater than the moving average. You can see light in the chart. So if you look down here, there's lots of light in the chart, okay, to the upside, lots of light to the downside, lots of light to the upside, downside, upside, and so on and so forth. We can measure that by simply counting the number of days of daylight, or Dave light, I should say. And then if we have an intersection of the moving average or downside Dave light, we'll start counting to the downside, okay? This is not magnitude, this is just number of days, although it does sort of look like magnitude. Um, could you use magnitude as some sort of indicator? Possibly. I'm not a big fan of reversion to the mean type trading. But yes, by all means, you could use some sort of magnitude indicator. In other words, measuring how far away or how much daylight you have between the low of the price bar and the moving average to determine how stretched the market is. You don't want to run out and short a market just because it's stretched, but it pays to pay attention when it is stretched. And I'll flesh that out in a second or two. But you can see that this entire bull trend going back to the mid-90s, we had very, very little. You really have to squint your eyes to see it in almost all upside daylight. Very little downside daylight and then very little upside daylight. And draw your big blue arrow and you can see the big blue arrow pointed higher for a long, long time. Now, what's fascinating is, and I know I say this every week, seems like it wouldn't be that fascinated with it, but it's pretty damn fascinating if you think about it. The bear market of 2000 to 2003, there was absolutely no upside daylight. It stayed red the whole time. Now, it reset itself here when it intersected the moving average, but it never did have upside daylight. And then, of course, the bull run from 03 to 07, you had, you got to really, really squint your eyes, but right there and then right here, we had just a tiny, tiny bit of downside daylight. Not a whole lot to worry about. Now, one thing that I've been paying attention to with this daylight concept, and I've done this for many, many years, this was first published in 1996. I was actually in a webinar the other day, and somebody in the webinar remembered reading the article when it first came out, which was very exciting for me. But one thing that I like to do with Dave Light is just see how long it stays below 
the moving average before getting too concerned or taking action. You don't want to take action or get bearish, however you want to look at it, when you're just getting a little tiny bit of, of daylight, especially when you have a lot of daylight to the opposite side. But as that count begins to increase, like it is here, as you can see, you're getting more and more downside Dave light. You might want to pay attention to the fact that maybe, just maybe, the trend is turning. Now, on the upside here, back in 2010, 2011, in that nice little run we had from the bear market lows, you could see that it was green except for just a little bit of time in here. Now, it doesn't mean you want to stay long and hold on to your longs for dear life. Obviously, you want to use stops to take you out when the conditions are getting a little iffy. But if you're taking a big picture view just to see where you are in a cycle, you probably want to pay attention when you get a little bit of downside, Dave Light, but you don't want to panic. And then again, we had a little red to the downside. And this was a little bit of a move lower here. And then the remainder of the leg up, up until 2015, we had lots and lots and lots of upside Dave light. Now, you notice I have 100 drawn in here, plus and minus 100. It seems that from just a little empirical research, Whenever you kind of get up in this frothyville, like you were here way back in 1997, and then here way back in 2014-15, you do get a little corrective action, at least back to the moving average. And then, of course, we had the period we we're just talking about, 2015-2016, where the market looked a little questionable in there for a while. And we actually did put some shorts on. Remember, this is a weekly chart. We don't sit around and wait for the weekly chart to turn. We do pay attention to the daily chart, but the weekly chart helps to give you that big picture perspective. Now, with that said, we look at the last little up leg we've been in, which is part of a much bigger leg. Notice that we had going all the way back to 2009, we've had almost exclusively upside daylight, except for obviously these two little periods in between when the market got a little questionable. Now, once again, we're getting up here at nosebleed levels, okay, as far as the number of days in the count. And we'll look at this in a lot more detail on our daily chart in just one second. And we don't quite yet have any downside daylight. We haven't tagged that 200-day moving average on a weekly. At least I don't think we did. I need to check to see if this actually tagged it. I should know that. We'll take a look at that in a second. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll look at that. Uh, I can look at it on, on the um, on the live chart. Maybe the live chart, when we get to the live charts, we'll see. Now, as I said, past a couple of weeks, maybe even longer, one of the things that I picked up from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts is that tops are more of a process than an event, and bottoms are more an event than a process. And that's kind of like just the opposite of what you would think, because we all think about the market when it crashes. We don't think about sometimes it just kind of melts up off of the lows. So getting to that process top, if we're looking at the S&P, it has become a bit of a Jackie Mason market. It was up, it was down, it was up, it was down, it was up, it was down. Or Katy Perry, as somebody pointed out last week, it's hot, then it's cold. It's uh, up, then it's down. It's all over the place. Now, there's nothing magical about moving averages. There's nothing magical about the 50-day moving average. There's nothing magical about the 200-day moving average. There's nothing magical about the death cross. But all these things can help to give you some perspective. Now, if you take a look at the 50-day moving average, it has a pretty serious downward slope to it and this 200 day moving average still has a positive slope so it's obvious that these two are at least attempting to cross paths now with a moving average especially a an simple a simple moving average you have a drop off effect when you drop off old prices and add in new prices the moving average will move in the direction of the new prices. 
or in this particular case, you're dropping off high prices and ending in low prices, it's going to make a, a quick move lower. Notice that even though the market was kind of all over the place, it's kind of like drifting higher because you're adding in about the same prices. Uh, years ago, I used to work for a hedge fund, consult with a hedge fund, I guess I should say, and he used the 30-day moving average because, it's, because it worked in with his analysis. And what I would do is I would pay attention to it, and I would do some mathematical calculations to figure out where that moving average was headed to help him in his work and his trading. And I would just simply look at, okay, what are we dropping off and what are we adding in? And if you're dropping off up here and adding in, in here, that means that that moving average is going to drop. Now, it will begin to flatten out, which is kind of interesting, fairly quickly once we start adding in prices down here and down here. Okay, so that's going to be kind of cool. But right now, it looks like it's really headed, it's headed towards that 200. And then that 200 is going to still catch up, and I didn't count the number of bars, but let's say probably about way back here somewhere, 200 days would be probably way back in June. So you're getting rid of prices down here, and you're still adding in much higher prices. So that 200 is going to continue higher. So these two are in the process of converging. Now, death cross. Oh, the death cross. I've done... Many of presentations on this. And the last time we had one, the point I was making with the death cross, and when we get to the live charts, maybe I can show you a few examples. But let's say you get those moving average crossing, okay? That 50 goes down below the 200. Well, it's called the death cross. It's not the end of the world. But this doesn't test out very well. My friend Rob Hanna says there's a tiny edge in it. Some people say there's no edge meaning that you would sell the market when this happens and then you would buy it back when it crosses back above. This is not what's important here. What is important is the magnitude of the drop below. And I need to find those statistics or the YouTubes where I did. I think if you go to my YouTube channel and search for death cross, you'll find the presentations where I did this, where I talked a lot about the magnitude. <laughs> Excuse me, my um, sneeze button is not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> i got to reach over, push a button, wait 10 seconds, and then it goes on mute. And then when it comes back on, uh, pain in the butt. Anyway, some of my clients said, I've never heard you sneeze in a webinar. Well, <laughs> never say never. So anyway, the point I was trying to make there is that the magnitude is very, very, very important. You don't want to trade a signal in and of itself. You want to pay attention to the magnitude, just like getting back to any signal or let's talk about my bow tie signal. OK, let's say you have an all time high and you get a bow tie. OK, well, this is a confirmed top until and unless that high gets taken out. Now, you don't want to say, oh, I'm going to short this market, ride it all the way down to here, down 50 percent or whatever the case may be. And then, well, that top still remains in effect, Dave says, because until it's taken out, then you don't want to just turn around and ride it all the way back up. So these things aren't to be traded mechanically. Use your brain, use your head. Okay, you got a brain in your head, use it. And sometimes they can be useful. Give you an idea where you are in the cycle. Now, last couple of weeks, Gary Kaltbaum calls this no man's land, and I went to bed thinking about this and woke up thinking about this. And no man's land is just kind of an area, I guess Gary's referring to it, it's like an area where markets just could go either way, just kind of chops around. And I did some analysis this morning, and I really couldn't come up with anything earth shattering about this other than if the market is below the 200 above the 200 below the 50 you might want to be a little cautious but you can see that it's it's done that every now and then it'll do that you can see but i think the bottom line is and i'm going to show you some indicators here in just one second in addition to moving averages but the bottom line is well if that happens don't forget to draw your sideways arrow and right now in this particular case, 
Where are we now? Somewhere around here, 2650-ish. Where were we back in February? 2650-ish, okay? So again, make sure you remember to draw your sideways arrow. Now, on a daily chart, we have held the 200-day moving average. Now, by the way, notice that we had all this daylight in here for a long, long time. And then if you really squint your eyes back here, it actually did not actually touch that moving average. So we've had daylight in this market going all the way back to June, except for this recent test here and then this recent test that we saw just a week or so ago, a week or two ago, okay? Nothing magical about the 200, okay? But it can help to keep you on the right side of the market, especially when you're paying attention to concept, concepts such as Dave Light. Now, I was watching all the colors, all the colors in the world, all the money in the world <laughs> last night, and at one point they... Mark Wahlberg's character played a game of pickup sticks with the kids. And it reminded me of a lot of the work that I did early in my career with things such as linear regression. Now, the bottom line is with linear regression, this is probably where my persistency work came from. Linear regression mathematically, or I should say my persistency concept, meaning that when a market is going up day after day after day and you can draw a line through most of the bars, that's a persistent market. And that probably stemmed from linear regression, and I simple, simplified it down to just a trend line drawn through the bars. But that reminded me of if you've ever played pickup sticks as a kid, you just throw a bunch of little sticks on the ground. I forget the exact rules. you got to pull them out without um, touching other ones, and different colors mean different things. But it kind of looks like that on a chart. But when your chart looks like this, looks like the true pickup sticks pile that you would create, then you know that, the market is possibly changing direction, or at the least, it's not trending, okay? Well, again, never forget to just connect the dots, okay? When you do that, you can see, yeah, the market is all over the place. But this is kind of a fun exercise if you look at the chart, and then if you, even better, go back in time. I went back to the 60s this morning in the S&P 500, mid 60s, big 60s, easy for me to say, and I played around with this, and it's kind of cool because it'll start changing direction, and it's kind of a fun thing to do. So if you get bored, play with something like linear regression. You know, all these numbers are up here. You can uh, snapshot this screen. You can see what I've got on the chart. And you can see over the fairly short term, the market is actually headed higher, or you could just eyeball a chart and see it. The other thing to glean from this is what? Well, just draw a big blue arrow. Once again, 2650, 2650. But this kind of exercise can be kind of fun, and it's kind of interesting. If you back them out to late last year, early this year, what do we have? Well, you have everything kind of together. It almost has a bit of that bow tie look to it. And when you play around with this, you'll see that they do change direction and they kind of begin to look like a bow tie when the market begins to turn. But right now, or back then in, in earlier 2018, late 2017, obviously all these cycles were in the same direction and the market was headed higher. And then don't forget to draw your big blue arrow. So since we were plotting a lot of, since I was plotting a lot of charts this morning, I just thought this would be something fun to throw out. Um, it is fodder for research. It is kind of a fun thing to do. One thing I was looking at this morning is, when the shorter term linear regressions or above the longer term linear regressions, obviously that means market strength. And it's just something that just another little tool to play with. But the bottom line is all linear regression does is draw a line through as many bars as possible. It's it's at least what they call it. I'm going to show you what little though. No, I know about math statistics, but it's at least squares method or at least it, it basically fits a line to the chart. Now, one thing we have to watch out for is, is the submarine pattern still in effect? <laughs> I, I've plotted years ago, like whenever there's a bear market, I always draw the submarine pattern and it creates a little bit of a buzz. Day before yesterday, or I forget exactly when, it was earlier this week, a friend of mine, 
he runs uh, the Twitter handle Stock Cats. And he's, it's an alias. He's got like a little cat in a suit. <laughs> and he's got like 10 times the amount of followers that I have, which is which is embarrassing because I'm a real dude. And that's a fictitious cat, car, character, a cat. Character, character. Anyway, he's got more people following this uh, fake persona than I got following my real persona by, by many times. But anyway, as a joke, he drew a snake pattern where he just drew like a snake on the chart. And so I replied back with the submarine pattern that occurred in the S&P not too long ago. This is actually a joke. I forget about my international fans or readers, or whatever you want to call them. I forget that they don't, they, they take me more seriously than I really am. Okay. I, you know, we're not going to get, none of us are going to get out alive. So I try not to take myself too seriously, although it seems like in more recent times I have, but I'm trying to cure myself of that. Anyway, I actually got asked to go to Hong Kong to talk about this pattern. <laughs> I had to explain to him that it was a joke, but I would like to return to Hong Kong someday and talk about my other stuff. Now, when we get to the, if we look at the sector action, and I'm looking at some of the major sectors here. This is the XLK. You could actually trade this. Notice that we did have a bow tie here back in February, but it didn't trigger. Now, by trigger, I mean that the lows were never taken out. A recent low was never taken out. So, for instance, you can see you have the bow tie here, and you got a higher high and a higher low. And notice that it just keep it kept doing that, and then eventually the moving average just crosses back over. So that negates the signal. Went on to make new highs. Okay, we got another bow tie, and this time we got a trigger. Okay, oops. So this is what I call the second mouse signal, even though this one didn't trigger. But let's say this one did trigger. Officially, that would be a second mouse. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So sometimes these second signals are more powerful. Well, that makes a little sense because you end up with something like a, a double top. Okay. Or even maybe like a weekly bow tie or something. That sec second signal can be more powerful. I knew a person who hired a lot of traders and now they were doing more intraday stuff, but even still, the new guys could only take second signals. So they'd have to have like a first signal. They weren't using bow ties, but let's just for argument's sake, instead of using bow ties, so it's like, okay, I see a bow tie. I'm a new trader. I'm watching this bow tie, but I can only take the next bow tie that comes along in the same direction. So if you were having trouble getting faked out a lot, then by all means, take that second signal, that second mouse signal. Now, the only trade-off there, and I guess that's why they call it trading, is the only trade-off is that you would miss a lot of first moves. But if you were being hired, like some of these uh, kids were coming in this guy's firm, then to keep your job, you're not worried about catching that first signal. You're just worried about doing what you're told. So that's technology. That's the XLK. If you take a look at the NASDAQ, very similar pattern. Now, what's interesting is the NASDAQ did not actually make a bow tie. These are daily charts, by the way. If you look right here, you can see. Most of my work is done on a daily. I do like to look at the weekly to gain a little perspective. Okay. But you can see that that was not a bow tie back in February, although it sort of looked like it. Because you didn't have the crossing. It wasn't a complete crossing. And by the time it was nearly a crossing, price had moved back up. And what did we just say earlier? What did I just say earlier? Would you have a market get above the moving average, the exponential moving average, that is? The exponential moving average will immediately turn. Notice that the 10-day simple moving average did not turn right away. But these exponential moving averages, even though they were longer term moving averages, 20 period and 30 period, immediately turned back up. So if you go back and look at this, this was not an official bow tie back here. Again, even though it looks like it. But the latest one that we had trigger or occur, I should say, in the NASDAQ was. So you have a higher 
low and a higher high here after your trend signal. The trend signal is that the 10 crosses back below, crosses back below the 20 and back below the 30. And then the 20 crosses back below. Well, let me just rephrase that. The easiest way of doing it is the 10 simple is greater than the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is greater than 30. And then those relationships flip around to where the 10 is less than the 20 and the 20 is less than the 30. Okay. When it occurs over several days, usually three or four days is ideal. It gives appearance of a bow tie. You want a bow tie that has a tight fulcrum point like this that looks like an actual bow tie as opposed to one that looks something like this where it's kind of they're kind of all over the place and then they eventually all cross down or cross up whatever the case may be so this did trigger a signal right here technically in the nasdaq on a daily chart not the end of the world but a signal nonetheless semiconductors made a somewhat similar pattern except that the semicolors semiconductors did actually bow tie and they did actually trigger sort of. Well, you can see this would be your entry here. And if you were following in higher on the pullback, you finally did get a trigger on this one. But this was an inside bar here. And it just kind of barely got below this low. You can barely see it if you look closely. There's a little entry point. So it sort of triggered, but I wouldn't count that as an official trigger. Because when you, if you're trading a pattern, you want to give it some wiggle room. Let's say you're going to say, okay, well, look, I want to short this market. My signal is here. Dave says get in below the low. Well, give it some wiggle room. Maybe get in right here, okay? And as this market pulls back, maybe still give it a little bit of room. You know, let's say, for instance, on this day here, maybe wait for it to take out this low here now that we've risen above that low, okay? So you might want to look to make sure that market has a pretty serious trigger notice that you kind of drifted up in here maybe like down here or something and then notice the next day it goes higher and then those moving averages do what they turn right back up so that signal was negated now the trend signal in and of itself remains in effect until what you go on to make new highs which we did and now we have another one of those second mouse signals in the semiconductors and like the xlk it recently triggered okay not the end of the world, but something that we need to pay attention to. The other thing we need to pay attention to is what? Where are we back in December of 2017, and where are we now? About 3,600. In other words, we're going sideways. What does that mean for a trend follower? It means there's no trend to follow. Take a look at banks. As you can see, this is you can see it didn't. This wasn't really a clean bow tie, and then it got kind of sloppy here. So in a case like this, like, okay, we made a high here. Now we've got a low here. The moving averages are in downtrend proper order. This market looks like it's in trouble. Not that you didn't want to rush out and short it, but so far it looks like it could be in trouble. Take a look at the energy stocks. The energy stocks did roll over. They did bow tie. And now they bow tie back up. Now, I'm not as excited about this signal as I would be about this signal here. And you can see we did a pretty serious slide out of this. This is more of a first thrust where you get a thrust lower followed by a little pullback. You got a little bit out. You might have gotten a swing trade out at best. But they did have a pretty serious slide, at least for a little while. And now they're kind of breaking out. Now, from my perspective, I'm not, again, very excited about this signal. This would have to go on to make new highs for me to get excited because this is a major sell here. And anything in between can, can kind of uh, suck you in, spit you out. Not that you can't get sucked in and spit out at new highs and new lows, but I would prefer to avoid those signals that occur within those highs and lows. Now, what's interesting is USO did break out to new highs. That's the oil ETF. So we'll have to keep an eye on that to see what's happening. But it's already the whole media or everybody got all excited about it. And so far, we're not seeing much follow through on that. But it is it will be worth paying attention to. Maybe, just maybe, we'll have something we can get long. Take a look at retail. 
Retail is one of those more of a first thrust type of market. Go in and watch last week's presentation. First thrust, you have a short thrust lower followed by a retrace or a pullback. And sometimes just a little bitty pullback like that. And without reinventing the wheel, go back and watch last week's presentation. You can see the moving averages were a little, were a little slow to catch up. But now they're in downtrend proper order. If you were to plot your linear regression or just draw a line through the bars, you can see that that retail is just kind of fizzled out. So it has this big picture retrace look to it. And so far, it hasn't taken out that retrace, kind of like a reversed check mark. Gatekeeper-ish for those who are familiar with that pattern. Now, the trannies did the same sort of thing. They did kind of that reverse check mark. You can see brand new highs here, sharp sell off, deep retrace. And so far, that deep retrace remains intact. And you could argue that you did have some bow tie action here. It didn't really sell off that hard. But the one thing to gleam is that, like many, many areas, and like the S&P itself, transports have this deep retrace to them, or fairly deep. It's deeper than the S&Ps, but a retrace nonetheless. And then it stalled out that retrace level. There it is. I've forgotten that I'd drawn it in. So if you go in and look at your charts, you can have a lot of these. Kind of looks like a, what do you call it, thing? square root signs. Now, these are left over. These random thoughts are left, left over from last week. So once again, if we do get a death cross, remember it's the magnitude of what happens in between, not the signals in and of themselves. Be careful not to join the church of what's happening now. I see some of these gurus out there telling you to sell options on the outside of the ranges of this market. And just these um, a host of really bad behaviors. Don't get caught up in that type of, of stuff because eventually you can get in trouble. The other thing I'm trying to point out with don't join a church of what's happening now is if you're a trend trader, then recognize there is no trend right now, and it's okay to sit on your hands. Maybe air a little bit on the short side if you see some decent-looking shorts setting up, anticipating that possible rollover. Or at the least, on the long side, just be – very, 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 very selective. Make sure that you think you have the mother ball setups before going in. And as a general statement, you should almost always feel that way. Make sure you've got a really great looking setup. Um, it's never different this time. Those are dangerous words. And I left this in from last week, too, which uh, makes a lot of sense for a methodology like mine. Last year required a lot of, lot of discretion. We get stopped out to like the penny, technically or mechanically, I should say. And then the markets would turn right back up. But some of these stocks went up two or three hundred percent afterwards, or maybe not three hundred percent. But I know there's one or two in my head. I'm thinking went up a couple of hundred percent after kind of a stop, stop nick. And that's the thing about stops is they will hinder your performance as long as the market keeps trending. And that's what Mr. Judd Dotery was saying is that if anybody has kept complete pace with this market over the last however many years, I guess it's almost uh, 10 years now, probably doesn't have a plan in place for when the music stops. And we're beginning to see a little bit of that right now. And I'm not fear-mongering. I just want to get it out there. We want to get ahead of this. And I'm going to use a dangerous word here. I hope, I hope for many, many reasons – that this market is just in a big correction and we go on to make new highs and we have a bull market for a long, long time. Bull markets are much easier to trade than bear markets. But as I preach, if you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in. <laughs> so hopefully the market continue higher. Um, Another reason from the educational standpoint, my clients do not short, or most clients do not short, most people do not short. Quite frankly, shorts are a pain in the ass. If I never had the short again in my life, 
it would not bother me at all. But what they do, in addition to allowing you to make money when the market goes down, is they allow you to see both sides of the market. I often preach, especially in trading full circle, when I talk about shorting, when I go through my little soliloquy about to short or not to short, is that my friends who run lots of money on the long side, they always tend to be a little bit glass half full, except for one or two that I know of that, that do a lot of tactical timing. But for the most part, those who are long or only oriented tend to always be these eternal optimists when it comes to the market. And usually they're right because the market usually goes up most of the time. And I forget the exact numbers on that. Seventy something percent of the time the market goes up. But you can't hang your hat on that in and of itself. It's what happens in the other 25, 30 percent of the time that you have to worry about. And again, we circle back to the magnitude of what happens. NASDAQ lost 70 something percent of its value. So technology nearly got decimated in 2000, okay? S&P 500 itself lost over half of its value in 2008, as we all know. So the magnitude of that downside is very dangerous. Yes, the market goes up more than it goes down, but it goes down quite a bit when it goes down, and that's where it gets a little dangerous. Okay, trading full circle videos, you can start watching them for free just go to this url i guess i need to shorten that or you can click on i think there's a little link on the front of my website it's been there for about a year <laughs> uh coming up in a year i should say i think i'm coming up in a one-year anniversary that's very proud of this work um speaking of courses i am working to put together some courses uh, from i have tons and tons of content on my website somebody said you got all this great content why do you hide it well I'm working to unhide that and create a path to where you can go through this information and I can see what you've gone through through the learning management system and we can get you up to speed. And I know that there's a big attrition rate or huge attrition rate to people that come in, they find me and then they go away. And that's probably because I'm not doing a good job of walking them through the process and educating them. So working really hard on that. Keep an eye out on that soon. It's probably way too early to announce it, but you know me. I get excited about everything. All right, let's hop to the live charts. If you guys want to start asking about some individual issues, feel free to do so now. Let's take a look at that daylight in the S&P, Dave Light in the S&P. It's hard for me to start saying Dave Light, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at your stop picks. While I'm getting these charts set up, I guess it doesn't do me any good to ask you here, but for those who are watching the recording of this, whenever I get that published, did you try to make it to the show and you weren't able to make it? I've, I've gotten a few emails from people trying to figure out what's going on. So just let me know. But we have a lot of people registered. I just don't understand uh, why people aren't getting in. All right, let's take a look at those P's real quick. Um, I think I've pretty much covered the market to death, so there's no need to spend a lot of time. I just want to take a look at the weekly daylight, Dave Light, to see where we are. And again, start asking about, you can keep uh, asking about individual issues. Just be patient. I'll get to you in just one second. Keep them coming. Whatever stock you want to take a look at, we'll take a look at it. From a trend-following perspective, obviously. So let's take a look at that 200-day moving average. Okay, Frenchie says the link is not working. It states that the webinar will begin next week. Hmm. Okay. I wonder why it's doing that. we got to figure that out. I hate to scrap everything and start over when we've got so many people registered. Okay, here's a daily S&P 500. Uh, you can see that we do. Let's get a. Let's go back to a black chart here.
Dang it. Talk among yourselves. There we go. All right, we still have Daily Daylight. Daily Dave Light. Oh, we're back to Daily Dave Light in the S&P 500. Like I said a second ago, right here didn't actually touch. So we've had upside daylight for how long? All the way until this little kiss right here. And that was back when? In February. And then we kissed it again in April. Kind of uh, retested those lows in the, the not that much higher than the 200-day moving average was back here. And now we have a little bit of upside daylight. So that's good. That's a positive. But we still have that retrace look to it, okay? And so far, we're still in this leg down. Now, again, you don't want to go crazy on the short side. But you certainly want to consider one or two if you see something that looks great. And you want to be very selective on the long side. Now, the reason I pull this out, one take a look at the weekly. And let me put in the 50-day moving average is what we were using. So on a 50-week moving average, which is a 50-period moving average, you could see that we've had upside daylight for a long, long time, going back to 2016. And then if you squint your eyes, did we actually tag it recently? I don't think so. Let's edit the uh, moving average and make it thinner. So, yeah, you have to really squint your eyes, or we could actually look at it here. The low is 255380, and the moving average is 2555. Did it touch it? Am I on the right line here? Let's see. The low, 2553. So it actually did kiss it. Oh, that was my bad. Let's see. Somebody would have to do the math on that and check. 255380 Well, it doesn't look like it on my chart, but I guess that's why that um, I guess that's why we had that nose dive in the uh, in the in the chart in here. Let me pull it up real quick. Keep the stock picks coming. So that's why we had this nose dive right here is because we did actually hard to see. But we did actually touch it. So that's interesting. So that's a, a new development there that happened uh, just recently. Well, here's the other thing, too, though, which might be complicating things. Uh, Metastock uses a calendar week and this uh, telechart uses a rolling week. So that's probably the confusion there, but close enough for government work. Now, what else? Anything else when you look at before we move out? One thing I was looking at this morning is I was taking a look at like the foods. And it's interesting that there are those people who claim that there's always a bull market somewhere. Why won't this work? Here we go. You take a look at like the foods which people still eat in a bear market, food's not looking so hot, okay? Same sort of retrace pattern kind of happened there. And so far, it's looked like they're in trouble. So it's interesting that some of these defensive areas, such as foods, and consumer non durables looks a little bit better, but still doesn't look great. Certainly not a raging bull market there. So far, just a bit of a retrace. Consumer not durable, obviously, things that you still need to use, even though it's a bear market. Drugs is another one that be, that could be considered a um, defensive area. But as you can see, just kind of a, a retrace rally up and it's sold back off. 
All right, any stock picks in here? Hope. Did you say hope? There is no hope in trading. <laughs> All right, F and D. Okay. Well, you are making new highs in this stock. It is a relatively new issue. I'm going to say it looks okay. Uh, one concern is uh, it is a little wide and loose longer term. And your breakout here is just like one bar up. Ideally, you want to see some follow through from a breakout before you have the pullback. But you could certainly do much worse. Okay. Now, the other thing is I'm not super duper excited about stocks that are way up at these high levels, given the issue or what the overall market is going through. And what concerns me is that the bigger they are, the harder they can fall. And these people aren't splitting the atoms, even though it is a relatively new issue, which I'm a big fan of, IPOs, obviously. But they're, what, a home flooring store? So just kind of hard to get excited about that. ZG for Greg. ZG. Yeah, Zillow is one I've been watching for a while. And this made my Landry list. If you back the chart out, if you go back and look at the archives of the service, back here I actually had it as a buy side setup. Um, I just didn't want to take it for the aforementioned reason of it's kind of a, I guess, brick and mortar company. Zillow is the, um, I assume it's people that sell the houses. We actually have our house on Zillow right now. But you can see nice thrust higher, nice little pullback. But now let's count the number of days. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 23 days. So that's what? A month and change in market trading, right? Five trading days in a week. Let's throw some moving averages in there, see what's going on. So... It's headed lower for quite a while, so it's lost some steam. If anything, I would almost pay attention to this one for a potential short, except the fact that it's got a lot of support below the market, so I wouldn't actually take it as a, as a short. But I would no longer look to get long this stock. And the reason we didn't take it again was given the conditions of the overall market, given the fact that it's a stock at higher levels. Five. For Dennis, well, there's not much to get excited about here just yet, at least in this last cycle. It did break out to new highs. It's already coming back in. Like I just said, what you want to see happen, and let's see if we can get a, a blank chart up. When you have a stock that breaks out, as I said a few minutes ago, you don't want to see just one bar higher. So say you got a bunch of trading in here. You don't just want to see one bar higher and then it begins to correct back into that range. Okay. What you want to see is some sort of acceleration higher, some sort of excitement, and then have that correction back down. Somebody's emailing me. I'm in a presentation. You can come to the presentation. You can talk to me live. He's normally here. I wonder if he forgot. <laughs> so uh, I would avoid that. Maybe put it on your momentum list. Just kind of hard for me to get excited about anything at this juncture. Back to one of those Mikey modes. You know, you hate everything. You've never liked one stock that I've mentioned in the, in the uh, weekend charts. Well, the first thing jumps out at me here is that like the recent – one we were just looking at, Zillow, whatever, it's going sideways for quite a while. Now, it is an IPO, and IPOs do have a breakout characteristic to them. For instance, well, let me just see if my chart's right. Never mind, it's not an IPO. Well, not really. Um, no, it's, it's too many days in the IP. too many days, excuse me, in the pullback. So I would pass on that one. BGS as a short, right? Well, if you're going to short something, a lot of times I like to look at the overall market and match the pattern to the market. So right now, market's at kind of high levels. 
and it's possibly rolling over. So I would prefer stocks that are at high levels and possibly rolling over. A case like this, the stock's already at very low, low levels. The market can be a little perverse. And if you've been trading for more than one day, you probably like, no shit, Dave. <laughs> but by that, I mean that let's say you're looking at that, that a stock that's at a strong, strong, strong uptrend and the market's a little weak. And then the market begins to rally. Well, sometimes that strong stock will begin to sell off because it becomes a source of funds to buy something that's at low levels. Now, if we're in a long-term bear market, then by all means, that's all you're left with is charts that look like this. They're going straight down. They pull back. That's the only thing you can do. But right now, I would find something at higher levels. I'll give you a couple of um, – these aren't new positions. These are existing positions. But – Here's a couple of positions that we took. You take a look at this pin. It made these all-time highs. It made a bow tie. Also a little first thrust hidden in here. So we took this as a chart. It's not really paying off just yet, hopefully. Did I say ho hopefully yet is the key word in that sentence. And then the other one was Pulte. And same sort of action there. You got the bow tie. You got the first thrust. So it's coming off of these all-time highs. And in a case like this, it's possibly, and should I say hopefully, hopefully, bigger they are, the harder they fall. And you can see, look, it lost momentum in here, went sideways for a while, made those marginal new highs. What did I just say? If something's going to break out, you want to see the mother of all breakouts and have it not look back. You don't want to see it break out and then come back in. By the way, on this one, what I was telling my peeps is like, yeah, this kind of sucks. This move against us. But notice that it really didn't break out, and then it already came back in. If you think about the psychology of the market, I can guarantee you, I can all but guarantee you, there's a lot of people still holding on to the stock that bought it somewhere in here. And they're waiting, just waiting to get out at break even. I can almost guarantee that, okay? And this little rally up here gave them some false hope. And now they might be feeling a little pressure to throw the towel. They're really going to have pressure on them if we take out 28 in here. Not that you want to – one of my clients says, hey, I didn't take that trade because I was just starting the service. I wasn't quite uh, – you'd, you'd recommended it before I got in. Should I just jump in at 28? I'm like, no, let's just let, let that one go. So I'm not recommending as a new position. I'm just showing you the type of positions that I'm looking to get in right now. These shorts that are coming off of uh, these high levels could offer the most opportunities. At this particular point in time so that's what you want to be going after okay did we do coop is that the one we just beat up no okay yeah coop we just had too many days in the pullback okay bgs i think we just did that one okay any more quite a bunch today i noticed the numbers a little low this week again i think that the problem is people aren't getting in Grub did we talk about? I keep forgetting. All right, let's 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 go. Yeah, I don't think we did. Um, you know, one thing about this stock was I don't like stocks when they make a huge gap. It kind of went straight up, and then it kind of drifted, and then it tried to get its act together again, okay, which looked okay. But then you had this big drop in here over 313, so it's a month. It went down for a month. And then if you didn't know anything about trading, you could say, well, Dave says to draw a sideways arrow or an arrow period in a chart. So you can go back to February. So that's nearly two months where it hasn't made any forward progress. So let me clean this chart up. So it was off to the races. Oops. It was off to the races back here. And then – as Janet Jackson would say, what have you done for me lately? Not much. Okay. Edit. Yeah, edit was one that we were looking at. Nope, maybe not. Yeah, uh, this might be listed as a short. I'll have to check my list. Um, it is a bow tie down off of uh, all-time highs. You've got quite a few – days of the pullback ideally with a pullback pattern 
first thrust or bow tie, when it begins to pull back, I like to see it just pull back like a day or so and then begin to implode as opposed to just pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. It's got 12 days. So I think it's still in trouble, but I would pass. And then the other thing that would concern me a little bit about this one, it is a biotech. It's, it's also a little wide and loose. It's got a lot of support down here. So if this company comes out with some sort of big news announcement, it could blast higher. A little dangerous to short, at least short the biotechs at this juncture. So I would, I would stay away from that one. But good eye as far as catching something that looks like it could be in trouble. ACAM? Um, no. The problem here is uh, what big gap up, okay? And then let's draw our horizontal line. And then if you're playing the pullback from highs, it made a pullback here, pullback for what, a month? So that goes, that's a month and change. So no, there's nothing there. Nothing to get excited about there. Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah, two things. I don't want to beat anybody up. Keep in mind that I'm preaching my methodology, which is not necessarily be all end all. And number two, I just don't like market conditions. So it's going to really have to knock my socks off. There probably won't be any high fives today. All right, SGH, it broke out. It came back to where it broke out. So that's the first no-no. Second no-no is it has a gap against the trend, okay? We're trying to go long. It has a gap against that. So I would leave that one alone, okay? And, Greg, I promise you, I don't hate everything. Sometimes I will like something, but not today probably. QDO? Okay. Okay, we'll take a look at that. Yeah, the IBB, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you might want to put this one on your momentum list. It recently broke out. It looks like it's doing okay. It's getting a little acceleration in here. Let's back the chart out, see what's happening. Yeah, it's at all-time highs. Put it on your momentum list. My only problem, again, is that these stocks at all-time highs, with the market looking a little questionable, they might be a source of funds, okay? Now, it's nothing I've quantified. It's just that... If the market's looking questionable or wide and loose at everything, it's just sometimes dangerous to go after those last of the Mohicans, okay? With relative strength, it often ends badly. Now, if that was a beautiful setup, yeah, we'll reconsider. But, yeah, put it on your watch list, so let's see how it looks when it sets up. Uh, too many days of the pullback. I think this one was on my list recently. Uh, it is a relatively new issue, which is good, okay? And it can trade constant in the market. There is a bit of a breakout characteristics with characteristic with new issues. And if you go in and look at my website and dig around, and again, I'm going to organize this stuff to make it a, a lot cooler. But yeah, it would have been a little five-day breakout pattern way back here. Okay. But as a general statement, IPOs can have more of a breakout and follow-through characteristic than regular stocks. Nice little breakout here, you can see. Nice little pop higher. I would pass because it's too many days of the pullback. If I was, if it was a little bit further back in time, then I'd be more inclined to play that breakout type of thing as opposed to now. Now, somebody is saying, because I screwed up the entry process, IBB is hitting the 200 from underneath. All right, let's take a look at that. Let's make this moving average 200. We should have plenty of time to get to everybody, but keep them coming. Don't give up. Well, the IBB is sort of all over the place. I was going to say earlier, if you do want a short biotech, maybe go after an ETF. might be a little bit safer. But it's kind of all over the place. Where was it back in, I don't know, last July? Where is it now? 5%. There it is. It's Flatsville going back to what? Last June. Okay. Now, shorter term, I hear you. It kind of made that big picture, although albeit wide and loose, retrace up like the NASDAQ and like most technology. And I hear you. It's hitting the 200 from underneath. You could probably trade off of that and do okay. Daylight to the downside, go up and kiss the moving average. I know Phil, I don't know if he's in here today. Um, 
he does a lot of that type of work with the 50-day moving average. Yeah, WB as a short. Uh, this one has caught my eye. I think I might have put it on my Landry list. It's a little wide and loose, okay, but I hear you, okay? I certainly hear you. It lost steam in here, as you can see, and if memory serves, it's a bow tie. It's also a bow tie. Uh, if you had to short something, then yes, this would certainly work. It just has some support down here below the market, and it is a little wide and loose. So I would pass based on those two things, but that's as close to a high five as I'll give today probably. Oh, Oak Ta was actually going up, but I think it's going down now. Nope, still going up. Oak Ta was one we were watching, but you can see now it's had how many days since that pullback? A month and change. So too many days of the pullback. See if it breaks out to new highs and then maybe reconsider. It is a fairly new issue. Put it on your watch list, but it's going to have to make new highs with vigor and then maybe pull back. And it may be worth a shot then. Okay. Week. Is that a stock? Week. Week. I don't know if that's a statement. You're weak. <laughs> ENPH. Yeah, this looks really good. I do like this one. This is on my list for today. Um, it has some overhead supply, but that's at 10. Energies have improved as of late. I'm just not that excited about anything right now, but it's certainly not bad. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Quite a few days of the pullback, though. One or two more days of pullback, and I'd take it off my list. I just feel like I need something to kind of knock my socks off. Also, um, is this... Is this considered an energy stock? Why is it under uh, semiconductors? Anybody know that? Is it solar or something? Maybe somebody can do a Yahoo Finance on it real quick. Um, in the energies, if this is truly an energy stock, I would like to see the energies coming off of low levels and rolling up as opposed to in longer-term trend following mode. Inverters. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right, any more? Got a quiet bunch there. I guess not quite a bunch due to the uh, webinar glitches. All right, gone once, gone twice, XRCA, and send XCRA. Yeah, this looks okay. As a possible momentum stock, boy, flatline for a long time, huh? This has the it looks like a stock that reinvented itself somehow. Oh, you guys woke up all of a sudden. That's good. Yeah, um, maybe on a pullback. Put it on your watch list. It's not jumping out of me just yet, but on a pullback, yeah, it might work. Bigger, yeah, yeah. Well, as, as I often say, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. It just hasn't really given an entry just yet. So it did take off, but no entry just yet. Want to pull back? I wouldn't mind. A, I actually wouldn't mind a deep pullback on this one. So yeah, keep that on your watch list. That might be worth a shot. Send. Um, this looks more like a short than a long. It's a new issue, so I would not short it. But it kind of jumps out at me as a short. Let's put the moving averages in. Not quite a bow tie, but kind of an inverted cup and handle first thrust. So I would say that's more of a short than a long. It broke out and then came back below its breakout levels. Okay. A A X N or Mike. Hey Mike. Um, another one of those. Off to the races, straight up, wide range bars, big gap. And what did it what did it do in that one day? So it went up 27%. So it went up like 40% in like three days, and then it kind of consolidating. Now it's trying to jump up again. 
I prefer just the opposite, like have it kind of slowly accelerate and then pull back. So I would I would take this one off your radar. It's just it's gotten too squirrely and too crazy. X O N. Um well, it's getting ready to come into a big fat tons and 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 tons of overhead supply. Remember, markets can often have long, long memories. So, yeah, sure, some people back here probably are dead by now or whatever, okay? But you'd be surprised how long people will hold a stinker. So it's got a lot of overhead supply to deal with, okay? Thank you, Greg. You have a good day, too. PJT for Dennis. PJT. I remember it used to be like 10 Dennis's in here. Okay, it's a brokerage. Never heard of it. It did break out with a little bit of vigor. It's kind of all over the place longer term. Longer term uptrend, obviously. Maybe on a pullback. It's a little bit on the thin side. Not super duper thin. As a private trader, you could trade it. Maybe on a pullback, but, you know, the breakout doesn't look as impressive now that I zoom it in a little bit. And maybe because that's the HV is only like 30 on this. And it's only one day of breakout. So put it on your momentum list, but I would actually, I wouldn't play this pullback in here. I'd actually let it, like, like to see it break out further and then play the next pullback. So that's, that's just not jumping out at me. And here's the thing, too. Brick and mortar type companies, if it is truly a brokerage, such as like JPM, um, now this was on my list as a short today. I'm not really excited about short again. I didn't recommend it. I just want to show you something brick and mortar, big and thick, high levels. Okay, probably also a bow tie. Yeah, bow tie. That's going to get me a little bit more excited or look like more than a top. And we're shorting as opposed to buying a brokerage right now, okay? So go after your brick-and-mortar type of companies now on the short side. Okay, oh, did we just look at that one? Yeah, you're just breaking out to new highs here. Again, I'm not a breakout player. Um, if you were, let's take a look at the gold the commodity. Yeah, gold's kind of all over the place. It caught a bid yesterday. It's back in, but it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's hot and it's cold. Okay. So gold, the commodity, not looking so great. What are gold, the stocks, looking like? Gold, the stocks. Let's see. Gold, the stocks. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, gold of stocks are kind of all over the place, so it's going to be hard for me to get excited about a gold stock. As I often say, I like these commodities when they're down at major, major low levels to buy or major, major high levels to short. Anything in between, they really have to knock my socks off. Luna? Kind of a crazy stock longer term. Looks like it's getting its act together. It's kind of funky looking. It broke out. It kind of drifted. It's kind of taken off again. It looks okay. I guess if you just look at the breakout as one big breakout, connect the dots. I mean, it's okay. It just It's just not jumping out at me, just the way it broke out and all. But it's not bad. I mean, maybe, maybe enter above this high bar here and put a stop in below this low because that's right before the base. It's not bad, okay? I'm just, again, having a hard time getting excited about anything at this juncture. And did we cover this one? Um, well, it's making new highs, but it's just barely kind of breaking out. So if you did want to go after it, maybe wait for the next pullback. And ideally, you want to see it accelerate higher a little bit because you can see it really took off here kind of nicely. And then it lost steam. So I would wait for acceleration to pull back and then frame that within the fact that you're buying a stock at high levels, as long as the market still looks questionable, I'd be a little concerned about that. All right, last call. Anybody else?
Well, while we're in an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. I've been swamped lately by my own doing, just so I'm not trading and losing money. I've been keeping myself busy, waiting for opportunities. I would recommend you do the same. But anyway, because I've been swamped working on these projects, uh, just be patient with me on emails. And if there's something that you want to talk about, I will uh, be happy to do that next week. And if at the least I will uh, make it fodder and get an article out on something. But uh, anything you want me to do, just ask me, and I'll be happy to work on that for you. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls, plus a few more if we get the link fixed <laughs> next week. Again, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you so much.